Okay, so let's start then. So good morning everyone and um, welcome to this uh, webinar about trays. Uh, it's hosted by the Swedish Soy Dialogue, but in collaboration with the uh, Stockholm Environment Institute and Global Canopy. Uh, first of all, we would like to say that we're very glad to see the broad representation of participants from the Soy Dialogue members organizations. And uh, we really uh, are looking forward to have a discussion with you uh, today on the possibilities with Trace. So please uh, feel that you are active and uh, please participate in asking questions and so forth. Um, during the last Soy Dialogue meeting uh, this fall in November, we discussed the potential strategic next step for the collaboration in the network and uh, risk assessment on uh, meat and dairy import and also mapping of uh, key risk suppliers were ideas that we discussed uh, in, uh, during that meeting and by several of the groups. Um, and to explore uh, possibilities, uh, possible ways uh, to address this, uh, we arranged this uh, webinar to learn more about Trace. As an innovative uh, digital tool, Trace provides promising solutions for increased supply chain transparency. And we hope that this uh, webinar will increase knowledge about Trace, uh, but also give inspiration on <clears throat> how companies in Sweden can use Trace for risk assessment and supplier mapping. Uh, Trace is an initiative delivered jointly by Stockholm Environment Institute and Global Canopy. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to the speakers uh, for today. So first we have uh, Helen Belfield, uh, who is the Trace Director for um, uh, Global Canopy. She is core to both the development of Trace as a tool and how it is useful for different audiences, including both businesses, governments and uh, civil society. And during this webinar, Helen will provide us with the background to Trace and show us how it works. We also have Chris uh, West with us, who is the Acting Center Director of Stockholm Environment Institute's York Center. And he leads market engagement work for the Trace program. In his role, he's, he has been Trace's main point of contact for the Consumer Goods Forum Soy Buyer Coalition and UK-based activity around deforestation risk commodities, where Trace has been applied in the assessment of the deforestation risk exposed of uh, manufacturers and retailers using soy in their supply chain. So Chris will talk to us about the lessons from the Soy Buyers Coalition and UK Soy Roundtable, which we think could be of great inspiration for the Swedish Soy Dialogue. Also on the line, we have um, Emma Golub, who leads on specific engagement opportunities for Trace. And Emma uh, will be fielding your questions uh, today. And before I hand over to our speakers and Helen, uh, just a couple of uh, practicalities. Uh, first of all, we will share the slides after the webinar together with a link to the webinar. It will be uh, recorded. Uh, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation. You just use the chat box and we will address these questions after the presentation. And we will make sure that we have plenty of time for uh, discussion. And during the Q&A, Emma will raise one question at the time. And uh, finally, uh, we will also keep you on mute just to make sure that everyone's sound quality is uh, as good as uh, possible. So I will hand over to um, Helen to start. Great, thank you, Hannah. So as Hannah said, Trace is a joint initiative between Stockholm Environment Institute and Global Canopy that was first launched in 2015. It's funded by governments and philanthropic foundations, so in particular the Norwegian government and the Moore Foundation, um, which is based in the US. Um, so critically, Trace is not physical segregated traceability. It's a supply chain transparency initiative that brings together existing publicly available data sets, including customers' data, to map supply chains at scale and link buyers to production landscapes. 
So it's data driven, it's free, and it's an online open access platform. So Trace um, is a middle ground um, of supply chains mapping from producing regions to import markets via the exporting companies. Um, it's more granular than existing multi-region input output tables or life cycle analysis approaches, um, which is important because as you all know, the region you source from in Brazil makes a big difference in terms of the potential environmental and social impacts of that sourcing. Um, but equally, it's not farm to fork traceability, um, which is very challenging, it's timely, and it's expensive to do at scale. Um, and we don't think you need farm to fork traceability to make decisions and prioritize management of risks in supply chains. So trace um, covers entire sectors. Um, so it covers, for example, all Brazilian soy exports. As I've said, it links companies to places and therefore to environmental and social impacts in these places, such as deforestation or slave labor. It, it therefore enables the prioritization of risks and the identification of hotspots in supply chains. For example, it would enable a buying company to prioritize farm level traceability in a high risk sourcing region. Um, it's annual data, um, and therefore you can also understand changes over time. So without trace, this is what we would be able to see in terms of understanding sourcing from Brazil. With Trace, um, this provides much more granularity. So as you can see here, Trace maps the flow of volumes from soy producing municipalities. You can see highlighted on the map on the left via the exporting and then the first importing companies to the first import market on the right hand side. As a demonstration, I can search for Germany to isolate direct imports to Germany. And as you can see in a second, I can then expand on this individual supply chain and these specific connections. And I can see that um, imports are mainly coming from three municipalities. And if I click on these municipalities, these are all in the Matapiba region at the frontier of deforestation in Brazil, and therefore a high risk. So just, just give us an example of the, the power of trace to prioritize um, risks and supply chains. Um, so you can also resize the flows to reflect deforestation risk rather than volumes um, as well. So it's important to, to note some limitations here. So trace only maps to the first importer. Sweden's soy imports, as you know, were mainly from Norway and aren't directly imported from Brazil. So Norway does mainly source from Brazil although it's an unusual supply chain, as all the imports go through Denofa um, and are quite specialized because they're non-GMO to high sustainability standards. Um, but other exporters to Sweden, such as, as the Netherlands, also source from Brazil. So to assess the risks in Swedish imports, you need to look at re-exports from other importing countries. Um, and Chris will touch on this later in his uh, more detailed example. So, what data does Trace use to map supply chains? Um, so we use publicly available or publicly purchasable data. The backbone of Trace is the shipment records. Um, these come from different sources, so customers data, bills of lading, cargo manifests. And we do have the individual HS codes. So for Brazilian soy, we map both soybeans, cake and oil. But on the online platform, we convert these to a soy equivalent. It's important to note that the data is different for each commodity and, and country that we cover, and therefore the model does vary depending on the data available. So we use the best uh, available in, in each place. So in Brazil, this is excellent. Um, it enables a very data-driven model um, with the customer's data, including um, information on where tax is paid. And often this is the asset, such as a soy silo, which gives a very strong signal back to that logistics hub where that particular shipment um, came from. In other context, contexts like Paraguay and Argentina, there's less available data and therefore the data is, the model itself is less robust. Um, but in these cases, it can have more volume, uh, more value given that there's less data available in Argentina and Paraguay compared to Brazil. Okay. So 
Um, how can trace be used? So as, as I've alluded to a little bit, um, it can be used by companies uh, to understand and address risks in their supply chains. And we're working with a number of buyers um, and Chris will give and speak to, speak to this example to use trace to understand risks in their sourcing. It can also be used to track progress against zero deforestation commitments. Um, so for example, it can benchmark soy deforestation risks and imports for countries that have signed the Amsterdam Declaration commitment to deforestation-free supply chains by 2020. Um, and finally, we see a strong use case in terms of, in its role in linking companies to places, it can support the development of jurisdictional approaches and also provides buyers with information on high-performing places in terms of sustainability. So as a quick example to show the, the power of trace to identify priority regions, what you see here are sourcing regions for soy imports to the EU from 2013 to 2017. And what you can see is that although the Matapiba region, which is highlighted um, in red, um, only provides 16% of the volume of soy imports to the EU, it represents 85% of the deforestation risk for EU imports. So immediately you can see an area where the EU can prioritise to, to reduce its risk exposure. Um, so in terms of future priorities, um, TRACE plans to scale its coverage to more commodities and countries. So TRACE already includes soy exports from Brazil, as you've seen, um, but also from Argentina and Paraguay. Um, we also have Brazilian exports of chicken and pork, um, and critically, they're embedded soy deforestation risk um, from feed. And we also cover Indonesian palm oil and Brazilian and Paraguayan beef exports. Um, so in the future, we'll expand coverage to more commodities and geographies, and we'll continue to annually update the data. Um, beyond scaling coverage, we will also continue to work with users including buyers to understand how, how trace data um, is being used and also how we can make it more useful, for example, with um, projects with companies to connect their supplier data to trace, um, which Chris will speak to next. Um, so I think, Chris, I'll hand over to you now um, after that introduction. Okay, thank you, uh, Helen. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, please shout if... Um, if not, so yes, I'll, I'll just cover um, quite briefly some of the, the work that we've been doing to pilot uh, the trace uh, data with um, principally the, the something called the Soy Buyers Coalition, um, but also I'll mention some other points of engagement with some of the downstream companies and countries as well, uh, and some of the um, lessons we've learned from that. Um, so one of the initial pilot uses of Trace uh, and our data has been our work with the Consumer Goods Forum and uh, ProForest, who are an NGO, um, around the Soy Buyers Coalition. And the purpose of the Soy Buyers Coalition was to establish um, what we call a coalition of the willing, a group of companies who were concerned about um, deforestation risk that were embedded in their soy purchases and were, who were committed to identifying <coughs> in in in, collective, uh, in a collective sense, um, the key risk areas that are linked to their supply, and hopefully taking action then to improve the circumstances um, in the places of production to which they were linked. Uh, and they were proposing to do that via the support of credible initiatives in, in Brazil. So it's worth noting that the initial focus of the Soy Buyers Coalition has been Brazil, um, but um, that was, um, a decision based on uh, the priorities at the time and also the availability of, of trace data which has somewhat expanded since. Uh, next slide please. So the, um, the Soy Buyers Coalition has comprised um, around 12 to 15 members of the Consumer Goods Forum um, with participation, the activeness of that participation varying across the last year or two since we started the process. It's been quite a um, a flexible process in that we haven't sort of pinned companies to to making core contributions but essentially we've had about 12 15 companies actively collaborating with us in um in discussions and in the provision of data um we've been working closely with pro forest on the development of a simple um and scalable methodology for risk analysis which i'll provide an overview of in a second and as a result of this work what we've been doing is identifying a number of prior priority municipalities 
um, that can be a source of attention by the coalition, as well as a number of potential initiatives that could be supported. Um, we were hoping in the latter part of 2019 to move to a stage of implementation, but that's been um, slightly delayed at the moment um, for a number of reasons that I'll come back to at the end. Uh, next slide. Um, so under the uh, Soy Buyers Coalition, uh, our analysis has been divided into two uh, main stages. First, we undertook um, a rather high level national scale assessment of risk. And this was then followed by analysis which incorporated company supplier information where, was it, where this was available or made available to us. In order to first carry out um, the high level analysis, we um, had to decide upon the focal countries of import that would be covered. Uh, and that was largely dictated by the focal regions of interest or the markets of sale for the companies involved in the coalition. Um, so we ended up covering uh, as, as importing countries, the EU 28 plus Norway, uh, plus the USA and the imports from those into those countries from Brazil. We then used two um, primary criteria to, to assess the relative deforestation risk exposure of those focal countries uh, and then eventually to transfer those to company level. Uh, and those criteria were the export quantities or volumes of soy reaching um, those countries of import and also the deforestation re rates occurring in source municipalities linked to those exports. We had six companies in total out of the 12 to 15 that actually supplied uh, the trace team with information sourced from their suppliers and that was done under data sharing agreements with the trace team. That allowed us then to tailor the, the first tranche of higher level analysis to identify a list of 10 shared high priority municipalities for attention by the coalition. Next slide, thanks. Um, so for a high level analysis, just starting there, here are the results um, of the analysis of municipalities which supply our focal countries of the EU, Norway and the USA. And we decided to select a threshold of the top 5% of municipalities with the highest tonnage of exports between 2015 and 2017. So we covered a number of years, a recent years of export into those countries. And those, uh, that top 5% of municipalities in Brazil is shown in the map on the left. And 78% of the total tonnage exported to our Soy Buyers Coalition countries is exported by this top 5% of municipalities. Uh, many uh, municipalities export very small volumes, uh, as you can see from the figure on the right hand side. Next slide. And then the, we did an equivalent uh, assessment of the uh, deforestation rates, uh, rates again, uh, selecting as the highest priority a threshold of the top 5% of municipalities with the highest territorial deforestation rates between 2015 and 2017. And again, these are shown on the map on the left hand side. Um, note for the Soy Buyers Coalition, we decided to look at total deforestation rates in municipalities rather than just deforestation driven by soy expansion. Um, that was a choice driven um, by, uh, in consultation with, with some of the companies and the Consumer Goods Forum, but it is um, important to note that we can just look at um, directly a direct conversion from soy as well if we wanted to. Having screened the information, uh, the eventual results of this, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to the priority municipalities, but it does, um, does change some of them. 70% um, of total deforestation is concentrated in, in 5%, in that top 5% of municipalities. So again, a relatively small number of municipalities captures most of the deforestation uh, occurring in Brazil. If we then combine those uh, two thresholds, next slide, please. Um, we, it results in a division of municipalities into four categories with the dark purple top right classification there covering the, the municipalities which have the highest level of exports to the soy buyers coalition countries and the highest deforestation rates. And that formed an initial list of 58 high priority municipalities for attention by the soy buyers coalition. And as indicated on the map on the right hand side there, those municipalities are focused in two primary regions. One is the uh, Mata Piba region in the east of Brazil, uh, which is known for having uh, some of the highest deforestation rates and, uh, in Brazil. And the other region is the northern edge <coughs> of uh, the Cerrado biome in northern Mato Grosso, uh, again with high deforestation rates also occurring in those areas. Next slide. Uh, and if you could just uh, click again so the text come up. 
Thumbs up, thank you. Um, so in order to try and get down to a more manageable set of priority municipalities, we then utilised the supplier information that we've been sent by companies in conjunction with trace data to refine these results down. And given the differences in data across those supplier data sets, and also the general lack of traceability in soy supply chains, we did not and didn't expect to um, conduct a traceability assessment. Instead, uh, what we were trying to develop was what we termed a qualified association between um, Soy Buyers Coalition company uh, and supplier data and the supply chain information uh, derived from trade. Broadly speaking, just generalizing the approach that we took, um, we first conducted a, a basic screening and filtering exercise on individual company data to assess uh, the level of connectivity that they had with the initial list of 58 priority areas that I've just summarized. We then re-ranked for each company that priority list based on their information. And then finally, across the, um, the companies that supplied data, um, we identified those municipalities which had shared high rankings. And from that list, we selected 10 municipalities as joint priorities for the coalition. Next slide. So this slide just illustrates um, the type of information that was made available to us by the companies, and that's listed on the right hand side. And then we try basically to make connections between that uh, data with the type of information that Trace provides us with. It's uh, worth noting that no company uh, that we actually received data from covered all aspects which are illustrated on the right. Each company had various different levels of information, which depended on broadly the extent to which they had engaged their suppliers on the issue of soy deforestation to date, and also the relative position of the uh, company in the supply chain. So a manufacturer typically would have different information compared to a retail company, for example. For some companies, uh, we were able to provide, um, we were able to obtain information on crushing locations, um, which, uh, which were typically manufacturers, and that allows fairly accurate linkage to trace information. Other, other companies were only able to identify the traders that they were sourcing from, and some companies couldn't even do this. But what we wanted to do uh, in general within the coalition uh, analysis was to provide a method that was scalable and amenable to the different types and qualities of supplier information. So the process we went through of screening and filtering was amenable to the different levels of information that we were able to uh, be provided. Now, next slide. So I won't go into this uh, slide in a lot of detail, um, but this just sort of summarizes a, a little bit more information how we made linkages between supplier data and trace. So for example, if we were told the country of um, sales activity, uh, for example, the markets that the company was selling into, we would screen data uh, from trace only to cover this country of import. Um, that's quite a simplistic assumption. We're just basically looking at and saying, okay, well, the trace data is providing import data into the UK. If you're providing sales into the UK, we assume that most of your soy is derived from UK imports. That obviously doesn't account for indirect flows, and that's something we were um, thinking of exploring going forward in more detail. But for this initial analysis, we decided to keep things simple and just focus on direct flows. As another example, if a if a company was able to, uh, to identify a processing facility in uh, their supplier information, we can make a very direct link to Trace Logistics Hubs, which meant that we would then filter the data from Trace down to a level where we were only covering uh, the municipalities sourcing um, uh, soy from those particular logistics hubs. Essentially, we were using what data was available to us. So, we wanted to, to use the available information, but do so with as few assumptions as possible, uh, with as simple assumptions as possible to avoid the complexity of the analysis. And essentially what we're trying to do for each company is to provide a, a relatively tailored analysis uh, for any given um, set of information. Um, I've got some slides at the end of the slide deck, deck, which as mentioned will be shared that cover this in a bit more detail as an illustration, but I don't have time to cover this right now. Um, as mentioned, after conducting the screening and filtering exercise, each company ends up with a re-ranked list um, from the original 58 municipalities. And those ranked lists were then compared across companies uh, with those municipalities having the highest rankings then selected in our top 10. Next slide. And this is the eventual uh, 
geographic spread uh, of municipalities that were selected in the Soy Buyers Coalition uh, in our top 10 list. Um, again, most sit within um, either the Matapiba region on the right hand side of uh, that map there, or in the northern edge of the Cerrado habitat in Mato Grosso. So um, again, we've got most municipalities um, from our filtering uh, are still linked to those high deforestation um, <coughs> uh, risk uh, municipalities. Next slide. So from that list of uh, priority municipalities, the next step was to start to identify particular initiatives that could be supported by Soy Buyers Coalition companies for support. And the intention of the Soy Buyers Coalition was to support initiatives that were either new or well established um, in locations of production. Um, so ProForest, our partners, our NGO partners who, are, who have a presence in Brazil, developed some criteria for um, screening initiatives. And this was largely based on the um, specific um, context of those municipalities when it came to the, came to the type of land use dynamics um, that were being faced in those particular locations. So again, for example, in our initial analysis, if we identified from um, municipal scale statistics that were there were high instances of illegal deforestation occurring in our priority municipalities, then the intention was to screen initiatives for those focusing on controlling illegality in those regions. In instances where, where um, municipalities were identifying as having higher um, levels of forested areas than those mandated by the forest code, we identified that those were then of, of risk of further deforestation um, on a legal basis and therefore we were starting to identify initiatives that were focusing on protecting legal surpluses of, um, of forests. And we identified initially several candidate initiatives that were um, initially discussed in the coalition as potential opportunities for support. The next slide. As I mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, however, uh, further scoping of initiatives has uh, somewhat stalled uh, in mid-2019 for a number of region, reasons. So this is essentially as far as we've now got within the Soy Buyers Coalition. And one of the primary reasons for uh, this slight hiatus um, was that a lot of the selected municipalities that we'd identified overlapped, as I mentioned, with the Cerrado biome. And in uh, early to mid 2019, a new scheme within the Cerrado was, uh, was uh, announced, this Cerrado payment scheme, or what's now called the funding for soy farmers in the Cerrado scheme, um, which was expected to be launched um, at any time really during the latter half of 2019. That's now been launched. Um, that essentially um, resulted in some hesitancy from uh, some of our partner companies to actually um, invest more attention on particular initiatives. Essentially, they were adopting a sort of wait and see approach to see whether um, they could um, support the Cerrado payment scheme. And obviously, uh, for those of you who know about this scheme, you'll know that it's quite a high profile and well supported scheme. So uh, we didn't want to preempt uh, you know, the, the um, participation in that scheme from some of the Soy Buyers Coalition, and we decided just to, to pause a little while to see what was happening there. Um, some, there were some other issues that we did experience, which are sort of lessons for, for this engagement process. Um, whilst um, we had fairly good consensus around the, the priority municipalities um, and that process uh, across companies, what we experienced um, when we were starting to start identify initiatives was that there was quite a, um, a lack of consensus across companies on the type of initiatives that might be supported. And that ultimately comes down to the particular priorities that those uh, companies had when it came to their own commitments and their own supply chains. Uh, and that led to some, um, some delay as well on, on building consensus about what might be supported. And ultimately as well, we also um, suffer from the problem that ProForest ran out of resource to conduct further analysis on initiatives to help companies make decisions. Um, however, despite all of, um, all of that delay, there is still consensus that the broad approach that we piloted, piloted here um, has some um, significant potential in providing linkages between downstream companies and high risk areas 
uh, of production and associated schemes uh, that could be supported. And essentially, um, we have the ability to either connect companies via this process to those activities which may be quite large, like the Serato payment scheme, or more geographically niche, um, depending on the priorities of, of the companies involved. Um, it's well recognized now um, in the context of uh, sort of deforestation risk um, commodity activity that operating in a pretty competitive manner is essential, both from understanding, uh, from the perspective of understanding shared exposure to risk, but also in terms of influencing um, the supply chains and production processes. And we see similar approaches and activities emerging in the UK, uh, in, in across Europe, and either even across um, trading actors, um, which um, which are in some instances adopting similar analyses and similar models of engagement. And we're continuing. It's worth noting we're continuing conversations with the Consumer Goods Forum and Pro Forest about how we take this work forward as well. So this this is still Solvay's Coalition is still active even though we're in a bit of a pause phase at the moment. Next slide. Just to mention briefly then our activity with the UK. Um, so the UK has um, sort of an equivalent platform to the Swedish Soy Dialogue, which is known as the UK Soy, um, UK Roundtable on Responsible Soy. So we were asked in the middle of 2019 to conduct a, a similar high level analysis for the UK as we've done just for the um, the Soy Buyers Coalition. That process identified that there were around um, 1.5 million tonnes of soy um, imported from Brazil into the UK between 2015 and 2017 and um, that was associated with a relative deforestation risk of around 48,000 hectares in that period. And undergoing a uh, similar process that we adopted in the Soy Buyers Coalition, we identified a list of 48, 43 municipalities um, that could be classed as, um, as high priority for the UK. Many of those municipalities overlapped with the 58 um, identified as part of the Soy Buyers Coalition, um, and those are illustrated on the, on the map there. Um, again, uh, illustrating the fact that you know, pre-competitive uh, activity and coalition, not just at national level, but across um, nations as well, could be helpful and would likely result in a shared set of municipalities and locations for attention. Uh, next slide. Um, so another example uh, of more recent engagement we've been undertaking uh, within the context of the UK is via something that the UK has established called the Global Resource Initiative, or GRI, which is trying to understand options for the UK, both in reducing its own deforestation risk exposure, not just for soy, but across multiple commodities, um, but also attempting to partner with other countries uh, and um, actors to reduce global deforestation linked to agricultural commodities internationally. So in the latter part of 2019, the UK established a task force um, to look at this issue uh, and that via a series of expert led um, work streams is discussing the policy frameworks, the private and finance sector activities and the monitoring and reporting methods that could be utilized within the UK and within the private sector to uh, measure progress towards uh, those objectives. The TRACE team is, is particularly contributing to discussions on uh, monitoring and reporting, uh, where there's a, a feeling that our information, the information provided by TRACE, might be useful in tracking progress um, towards those objectives over time. And uh, we're expecting recommendations to be made back to government from that process uh, in uh, February and Mar or March this year. And it's quite likely that that will include elements of um, recommendations around due diligence frameworks, around the identification of priority biomes for attention by the UK, uh, and, and it, sort of a recommendation for the UK to galvanise effort around those biomes. Um, there are likely to be recommendations about incentivising the finance sector, particularly in supporting uh, this agenda. And then there are also likely to be some guidance uh, being provided on the type of monitoring activity that could be adopted both in the short term and also developed over the longer term uh, to, the to fulfil those objectives. Um, in terms of uh, some key lessons across those activities, I'm so just summarising now. 
Um, there's clearly strong collective support for, for joint action, uh, and that's within the UK, um, within the EU and internationally across various consumer goods um, companies and, and, and traders. Uh, but I would say there still remains a relative lack of agreement and consensus around what form that might take and what uh, mechanisms are likely to be most effective. And I, I think that's leading to some uh, inertia. Um, I mean, pre-competitive action in itself is, takes longer to develop, um, but um, hopefully it's going to be more impactful in the longer term. I think it's been uh, important to note via this process that each company that we've been engaging with sits within a rather different context. Um, each company has different individual priorities, different levels of understanding, different relationships with their suppliers, different positions within the soy supply chain. And that means that navigating um, the process to, to inspire collective action when risks have been identified has been relatively complicated. Um, but it also means them from the perspective of, of things like trace data that actually individual companies are likely to get different levels of value out of utilizing something like trace. So many companies that we work with or have spoken to actually have better in information in some cases than on specific parts of the supply chain um, than trace would have, um, but equally may have other uh, aspects of the supply chain where they know, know less and therefore where trace data might come in useful. In other cases, um, companies really have very little understanding of their soy supply chains, in which case trace can act as a, uh, a precursor uh, to more detailed analysis that they might need to undertake. It's clear that there are several encouraging initiatives, including the Serato payment scheme that may be transformational in regions of production. Um, but it's also clear um, that there are other areas of concern, for example, other biomes outside of Cerrado that require quite uh, quick attention. This includes locations like the Chaco landscape in Paraguay and Argentina, uh, but those are receiving less attention relatively at the moment. And ultimately, it's unlikely that there'll be one silver bullet um, solution to these problems. And therefore, exploring various options in, in um, a pre competitive space is likely to be. Um, important and, and as I mentioned earlier that's why we want to continue the work that we've been doing within the Soy Buyers Coalition. Um, and um, it's likely then that there will be value um, in continuing to use trace data in, com in combination um, with supplier information and in collaboration with, with companies. However it's worth noting that the process of collecting supplier information is fairly time consuming um, some companies don't either want or don't have the ability to share that information directly with us as data partners. And um, in, in the UK, for example, there has been a process of collecting uh, more detailed information which has taken place across a number of UK retailers um, led by a consultancy called 3 Keel. Uh, that was a relatively time consuming process and that's still very far from achieving full traceability uh, in most cases and therefore falling back on tools like Trace will ultimately probably be important um, because full traceability in supply chains like soy is unlikely to be um, achievable. Having said that, we can get, as uh, mentioned by Helen earlier, a fairly good impression of where the highest risk areas are likely to be just by using Trace data and, and complementing that with a rather simple picture of a, of a Swedish or UK supply chain. Um, and, and ultimately there are limited locations which are under highest um, risk exposure. Next slide, <coughs> excuse me. So just finally, finally then I just thought I'd just comment on the Swedish context. Um, so it would be possible um, based on what I've just said to uh, conduct an equivalent analysis um, from a Swedish perspective. But the major uh, constraint or uh, factor that needs bearing in mind there, as mentioned earlier, is the fact that actually Sweden is, um, does not uh, import a lot of soy directly uh, from Brazil. Instead, most of the soy consumed in Sweden is either re-exported from countries like the Netherlands or Norway, or consumed in, in embedded purchases. So for example, as uh, feed going into meat supply chain from other countries like Denmark. 
Uh, we do have um, in the trace team the ability to make estimates of uh, such re-export activity or embedded flows, um, but those rely more on a model-based model approach rather than the <coughs> data-driven approach. Um, so whilst we can make estimates and we can incorporate, for example, the, the supply chains in Norway or the Netherlands and analysis for Sweden, um, that ultimately will be um, less uh, uh, powerful probably than uh, an, uh, an analysis of the direct supply chain that's been conducted, um, for example, for the UK. And from an implementation perspective, of course, um, if we're thinking about acting on the results of such an analysis, it's important to bear in mind that the influence of Swedish companies uh, in regions of production is, is likely to be relatively small, given the fact that um, Sweden is a relatively small soy consumer across Europe and across the world. Uh, and that's just something to consider, I think, when thinking about what activities might be engaged with and, and what processes um, and what forms that engagement might take. Uh, so next slide, just finally. Just to finish, as I said, it, it's probably possible for us to undertake a Sweden-centric analysis using the trace data. Uh, that would require further discussion on the purpose of that activity, i.e. whether that's um, being utilised to avoid Sweden's deforestation risk or to invest in, in best practice in regions of production, which is more aligned with what the Soy Buyers Coalition has been trying to do. It would also require a discussion around what the scope of that analysis would be. Is, is the focus just the Brazil, just Brazilian context or the Cerrado? Or would there be interest in opening it up to other locations where we now have trace data? There would be a requirement to have the discussion around the methods to use. So would something like the Soil Bias Coalition approach be sufficient? <clears throat> or would we need to be uh, developing something a little bit more uh, bespoke uh, or complicated? Uh, particularly bearing in mind, of course, this re-export and embedded uh, supply chain aspect, which is particularly important for Sweden. And therefore, and also ultimately we want to understand to what extent supply data is available and could be made available to us in the trace team and whether that sort of information is worth incorporating at all initially or whether just something simple using the trace data as a standalone thing uh, might be also useful. So I'll um, leave it there and uh, yes, open to questions. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we'll take questions now. Um, some of the questions have come in through the chat box, so you may have seen them. You can still submit new questions in the chat box if you'd like to do that now. Um, but we'll start with those that we've got um, already here. So the first question is, does Trace consider that only approved farms can supply beef to the EU and the location of these farms? Uh, Helen, do you want to start? Yes, so on this one, we don't have... so. Um, we do include information on which states are able to export to the EU. So the EU doesn't allow certain Brazilian states to export um, because of the presence of foot and mouth disease. This has changed recently, so we do include that information. Um, we also include information on the export markets that slaughterhouses are licensed to sell to um, as well. However, what we don't include because we don't have access to this information publicly is the information on the CISBOV um, farms. So that's um, a traceability system that any exporter wanting to sell fresh beef to the EU has to be registered in the CISBOV system, which is farm level trace individual traceability. Um, we know that exists and we know the majority of EU purchases of fresh beef come through that system, but we don't have access to that data. Um, but it's important to note that CISPOV isn't used for processed meat imports to the EU, so there's a lot of, there's still beef coming to the EU, not through that. I hope that was clear, um, but I'm happy to follow up with a written um, response as well in the future, if that's helpful. Thanks, Helen. Chris, did you want to add anything there? No, that's fine. I, I'm not uh, massively knowledgeable about beef, to be honest, so I'm sure Helen's got a better impression than me. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, so then on to the next question. Um, how will the Global Resource Initiative address social impacts? Um, and how can... So let's take that one first. You want to... Chris, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So um, the discussion to date around... Um, around the Global Resource Initiative, and it's worth bearing in mind that none of this is set in stone at the moment, and it, it's very much open um, for further discussion before the recommendations are made back to the UK government on this. 
um, has been that broadly speaking, um, it makes sense for the UK to align its activity with something called the Accountability Framework Initiative uh, recommendations. Um, so the Accountability Framework Initiative was a collaboration between a number of NGOs that were aiming to provide a bit more coherence around the sorts of impacts and ultimately the definition of what we mean by deforestation um, associated with some of these high-risk high commodities. Now they have come up with um, some sort of criteria around uh, what they, how they would define uh, social risks and primarily that is associated with things like the um, uh, use of slave or forced labour and also the working conditions associated with um, production processes. So it's likely that the UK will adopt um, some sort of commitment around those sorts of things, the, the um, uh, sort of use of forced labour and, and working conditions. Now, uh, in terms of the monitoring of that, that becomes quite complicated because there is no unified data set that actually covers those sorts of um, activities. So what we are suggesting tentatively in the GRI is that we take a sort of tiered approach um, to this where we try our best to get some high level statistics on the highest um, risk areas that might be associated with those sorts of uh, um, human rights uh, problems. And then um, at a finer scale, when it comes to the monitoring reporting, we would ask companies to actually um, look at it in their own supply chain in specific detail at um, particular high risk areas that they might be exposed to and elaborate and feedback uh, at the national level on attention that they've been putting to addressing those risks. So at this stage, we're not quite sure how we will be looking at them and addressing them, um, but that is very much gonna be a work in progress. Um, in terms of that monitoring and reporting. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Um, question about embedded soy mm -hmm. um, and assessing the risks uh, using trace um, for embedded soy and indirect flows. So specifically, the risk uh, around meat from re meat producers um, sourcing uh, from other parts, perhaps of Europe or even elsewhere in the world, and their exposure to soy risk. Um, who would like to do it? Helen, do you want Chris? I can start and Helen can chip in, if that yep. works. Okay, so um, so I don't need to teach you uh, to suck eggs, but the, the, essentially, as we know, there will be a lot of um, soy flowing from places like, uh, in, indirectly from places like Denmark um, via the meat um, imports. Um, so in terms of actually uh, addressing these indirect flows, the first approach that we will be taking to, to link uh, those indirect flows to trace data would be to look at Swedish national statistics on imports of different products that we think are going to be associated with soy and to understand there what sort of quantities are coming from um, those intermediate countries. So we can get a lot of that information from um, national um, trade statistics, um, either by the UN or from Sweden itself. Um, in terms of then linking that to um, trace, um, what we would need to do is then use the imported soy uh, into those countries as a as a proxy for the impact that then would be ex that Sweden would be exposed to. So we'd attempt to adopt sort of a mass balance approach if Sweden is identified as importing, I don't know, off the top of my head, 10,000 tonnes of meat from Denmark. We'd look at how much soy is coming into Denmark. We'd make, make some assessments about how that might be linked um, to the um to the Swedish supply chain that would necessarily have to be quite crude because we can't directly link um the, the Danish imports uh through to specific meat products which, which would then be um exported to Sweden we also have the ability to um, adopt more of a model-based approach um so we can combine trace data with something that Helen mentioned earlier called um, multi-regional input output modeling um to assess the volumes of <coughs> um, embedded soy associated with different sectors of consumption, including meat consumption. That is fairly useful at the national level, I would say, but perhaps less useful at the individual company level, um, because again, you're not getting a very good um, direct picture of, of um, the direct linkages between the supply chains. 
Um, so it is a challenge, um, but there are you know, approaches that we can adopt um, to try and get rid around those, um, those problems. It would necessitate though, assumptions that would have to be there and it would um you know it would be less um we'd have less confidence i think in the results that we have from example for them from the uk where you still have that problem we still get a lot of um imports via the netherlands uh, into the uk but we also have some direct um exposure as well so we can fall back on that direct exposure um so yes there are solutions but they aren't perfect great thanks chris um, and then a final question, which actually leads quite nicely to wrapping up as well and thinking about possible next steps, which for which I'll hand over to Hannah. But the final question then is, what if um, if a company on an individual case by case basis in, in a sort of private capacity together with Trace were to look at some of the, the detail at either end of the of the chain, so further upstream or further downstream than is currently visible publicly through Trace? What sort of information would, would we need to, to, to add to that picture for a single company on, on, you know, as a piece of work? So um, a question around perhaps satellite data, if it's further upstream or details about what is known about the supply chain if it's downstream and, and what a project like that might look like. Um, does anyone want to, Chris, do you want to pick that up? Um, <coughs> so, I think again on the on the upstream side, it really depends, you know, what the purpose of that analysis is and how that it, whether it's being done for a um, for an individual company or for a collective uh, group of companies. And ultimately, when we've looked at a lot of the initiatives um, that we were looking at supporting for the Soy Buyers Coalition, they are very much taking place at the landscape level, and therefore crossing a number of different. Um, you know, farms and, and municipalities and therefore getting really down to the granular level of individual farms um, may not be necessary. We also have the constraint that actually making the link between farm scale production and our logistics points is, is quite difficult and therefore we haven't attempted to do that um, within, within trace to date. Um, on the downstream side, um, Essentially, the sort of information that we've been looking, uh, we've been collecting from companies to date have, have described the types of products that are being sold, um, the intermediate processes of those products. So some of the, um, you know, major meat packing organizations, the feed manufacturers. Um, now, that's quite useful, that, particularly that supplier information in terms of understanding who might be um, the subject for further engagement. So the process that Three Keel went through was to identify first the sort of first tier supply chain, and then sort of slowly going back through the supply chain to identify um, the trading actors and the locations that those trading actors were sourcing from. As soon as we can get to the trading actor, uh, we can start to make an association with the trace data. Uh, and many of those suppliers will also have information on direct purchases from Brazil. They may have um, what are called Cert ID certificates from um, use of um, certified soy, for example, and that gives us a much better impression about specific sourcing locations. Um, but that's always probably at this stage going to be a very partial, um, pick, provide a very partial picture of ultimate exposure because a lot of the suppliers won't have that level of information. So it can help tailor the connections, but it um, isn't going to be, you know, comprehensive. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, Hannah, back to you then, um, really. Thanks, everyone. Yes, uh, thank you very much, both Helen, Chris and Emma. I just want to make sure that there is no more um, questions. Anyone? No, okay, so yeah, so I think I will wrap up then. And of course, you can just come back to us if you have questions after the uh, webinar. So, yes, thank you everyone uh, very much. And hopefully, you have uh, more knowledge about Trace now, and hopefully, some new thoughts and ideas on how your organization or uh, as, us as a collaborative in the Swedish Soy Dialogue can uh, um, use information provided by Trace. Um, I will get back to you with a summary by mail, including the uh, link to the uh, webinar. And um, 
It is, of course, also possible to contact Trace for an um, individual follow-up if you wish. So you will find their uh, contact details in the mail as well. So thank you uh, very much, everyone, and uh, we'll get back to you. Thanks, Anna. <clears throat> thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.